to a full and meaningful life, both meaningful life now and eternal life later. These three things in Luke 12 are hypocrisy, greed, and worry. Reading the first five verses about hypocrisy, it says, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, they were trampling on one another. Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after killing of the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And then in chapter, same chapter, of course, verse 13 following, we are reading here about Jesus... Uh, <clears throat> warning about greed. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable, The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. If there was ever a scripture that, that dovetailed with James chapter 4 about not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, it's this one. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? Jesus concludes, This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. And so that's the warning about greed. Next comes the work, the warning about worry. <clears throat> Verse 22, Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Verse 25 says, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Verse 31 and 32 conclude this by saying, Seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Yeah, your life is a mist. Why make a mess of it? But we all do. Your life is a mess, and the question is, how messy is it? There's a direct correlation between the amount of sin in the world and the size of the mess that we're in. <clears throat> I've read to you here from Luke 12 about hypocrisy, greed, and worry, but these are not the only sins. These particular sinful habits ignore God and seek satisfaction by seeking to lay up treasures here on earth, treasures of earthly prestige or wealth or security. Although Jesus is giving us warnings here and he states what he says in these negative terms, he makes several statements in Luke 12 that underscore the important truths about your life and mine. For example, in verse 7 of Luke 12, he said, Don't be afraid, you're worth more than many sparrows. In verse 15, he said, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In verse 23, 
He said, life is more than food and the body more than clothes. So it doesn't matter how much you have, your life is more than material things. This is the, the physical and the spiritual side of life that we're, he's talking about. As, G, as Jesus asked in one other place, what profit is there if a man gain the whole world yet lose his soul? You are both a physical and a spiritual being. Turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And I'll show it to you. Genesis 2, 7, where God made Adam. And it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Dust of the ground, the breath of God into the nostrils, making him a living being. You see there clearly that we are a composite of both heaven and earth. Physical and spiritual in our nature. <clears throat> And you cannot have a relationship with God if you approach him as just part of this world. No, he is the creator. He made everything else. He dwells in the highest heaven and he dwells in unapproachable light. And you cannot have a relationship with God from a distance. Who was that that sang song about God in the distance. I forget who that was. But it doesn't happen that way. <clears throat> God knows everything and he understands you better than you understand yourself. So get real about your life and get personal with God. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he'll lift you up. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life. You know, every day, you choose between life and death. Don't be stupid. Sinful, self-serving decisions erode spiritual life. You must train yourself to be godly. As Paul put it in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And listen to Paul's words in the same letter of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 following, as he tells Timothy what to tell rich people. 1 Timothy 6, 17, Command those who are rich in this present world. You know we're all rich compared to most people in the world? <coughs> Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. <clears throat> Your life is a mist. And it's to a greater or lesser degree a mess. But your life, and this is where 
This is the good news. Your life is a must. You didn't choose to be born. Some people who suffer wish they'd never been born. But you have no, and, and some people actually take their own life. But uh, the man who suffered in the Old Testament named Job, he wished he'd never been born, but he didn't take his life. He just cried out to God. <clears throat> Your life is a must. You didn't have any choice. You, you've been given a life to live. And the circumstances of our life, oftentimes, not our choice. But your life is more than a maybe. It's a must. Your life is more than an ought. It's a must because it is a trust from God. One of the Christian creeds says, what is the chief end of man? The answer, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Well, how do you do that? How do you glorify God and enjoy Him forever? Well, you do it by obeying Him. 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3 following says, This is love for God to obey His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus himself said that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Our life is more than just food, isn't it? And we need the light of life that comes from the Word of God in order to uh, in order to overcome the, the mess of this dark world. <clears throat> God has the right to tell you what to do. Got it? God has the right to, to you know, we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We want to be autonomous, independent, we want to be our own boss. But that is exactly the thing that's gotten us into, into trouble. And so, <clears throat> we should listen to what God has to say and hold fast to his word and obey. Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And what is his will? Well, back to Luke chapter 12. This is just, I don't know why, but the Lord led me to this chapter for, the, for today's message. Luke chapter 12, we've been warned about hypocrisy and greed and worry, which will rob us of fullness of life. <coughs> but life is more than just avoiding danger. Life is about being proactive. It's about doing good deeds. Being rich in good deeds. And here, starting at verse 35 of Luke 12, he says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Um... I could read all the way through verse 48, but um, look at 41. Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, 
Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, my master is taking a long time in coming. And he then begins to beat the men and maid servants and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he's not aware. He will cut him to pieces and assign him place with the unbelievers. Last verse, 48. The one, uh, last part of verse 48. From everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. God's will is that we manage what he's given us for his glory to serve one another. So let's continue to take care of one another and thus be ready for the master when he comes. God has given you physical life. You should thank and praise the Creator. God has given you spiritual life in Jesus. You should give your life to the Savior. For salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Your life is a must. I preached three sermons from the Gospel of John leading up to Christmas. And I'm going to review like the main verse from each of those right now. The Sunday before Christmas, I preached from John 15. And here's a verse from John 15. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The Sunday before that was from John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. And I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And then from John chapter 8, I preached on this verse where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's where I took our theme. <clears throat> and what did I tell you our theme here at Northside for this new year is? Somebody was listening. Thank you. Everybody say, the light of life. The light of life. That's our theme. That's from John 8, 12, where Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's your life to do with what you will, but choices have consequences. If you say no to God, then the consequence is to walk in darkness now and forever. If you say yes to God, the consequence is to have the light of life and to dwell with God in the light of heavenly city forever so don't say no say yes the invitation song that we're singing today is I've decided to follow Jesus you know what I said at the start of the sermon about <coughs> your life as far as in this world goes, is like that dash between your birth and death date. There's a 
poem called The Dash. And it talks about how what matters most is that dash. Because it's not only uh, the life that we've been given in trust, God has entrusted us with this life that we've been given, however long or short it is. Uh, regardless of what happens uh, around us, we're responsible for our own life. And so what matters most is not the birth or death date, but the dash between. And so when your eulogy is being read and your life's actions they rehash, will you be proud of what they say and how you spent your day? Let's sing this song. Let's all stand. If anyone has a decision to make regarding giving themselves to the Lord, seeking his will, just come forward as we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Jesus, um, may we be walking after him. May we be walking in the light of life. And may it make such a difference in our lives that people want what we have. May your will be done and your kingdom come this year in Vandalia. And I ask your blessing on this church first and then upon the community. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.